That's good. All right, thanks, um, thanks for having me. And um, it was a great talk by Mark just then. And um, it, I find it interesting that one of the, the oldest um, uh, fertilizers you studied in his trial there was chicken manure, and we still don't understand how it works, which is um, always good as a soil scientist to know that we haven't got all the answers yet. I um, want to talk about uh, soil acidity and so acid soil management. I just want to acknowledge uh, co-author Helen Burns, who uh, I work quite a lot with, um, at, with uh, New South Wales DPI. So Helen and I, I get around to a lot of uh, different areas, different growers and uh, look at uh, soil acidity. So I know that uh, you guys know a bit about it, but um, we'll just touch, cover some basics. So um, we are interested in acidity because it affects plant growth. And one of the major ways it does that is by uh, it impacts or creates aluminium toxicity. Now I'll tell you now, there are other things that it does. There are other toxicities, but aluminium is the main one. So even in soils that don't have a lot of aluminium, you can still have negative effects of acidity. But uh, just to show you, uh, how that works. A graph here on the bottom axis, the x-axis, you can see uh, soil pH measured in calcium chloride um, with 3.5 on the left going up to 6.5 on the right. So it's going, uh, as you move to the left, it's getting more and more acidic. On the y-axis going up the page is the percent aluminium, which uh, is the percent of the cation exchange sites, the places in soils that can hold nutrients, what percentage of, of those um, of those sites are actually occupied by aluminium. Uh, and so this is data for a range of like thousands of soils uh, in New South Wales. And you can see that's the spread. Now, things that sh should be coming apparent to you from that is that as you decrease pH, that is as the soil becomes more acidic, the percentage of, of aluminium on the exchange sites increases. So you get more available aluminium coming into the soil solution as the pH drops and it's exponential. So it, it really rockets upwards as the soil becomes more acidic. The, uh, another point to take out of that is that it's not a, a thin line, it's a blur. And so there are soils there, and if you just look at pH 4.5, there are soils there at pH 4.5 that have almost no aluminium in them. And then there are other soils that are 30% aluminium. And at 30% aluminium, it doesn't matter what plant you've got, it would be suffering. Um, and so it just highlights that just knowing your pH isn't enough to understand how bad your acidity problem is because, um, because of that variation. Uh, and I guess the other thing to note there is that once you get um, up over say five pH five, the percentage of aluminium is below 5%, which, you know, um, textbook, textbook sort of say, you know, plants can, uh, can grow reasonably well with um, aluminium percentages of less than five. Although that uh, we're finding that not to be the case always. The main thing that aluminium um, toxicity does, it, it affects uh, root growth. And it just basically stunts root growth and especially fine roots. And so on the screen here is um, uh, a loosened pasture. Both of these, this is all in one paddock. On the, uh, on the left, you can see it was limed, uh, nice fibrous root system. There are nodules in here. So the legume is actually functioning as a legume and fixing nitrogen. And on the right was an area that didn't receive lime. And you can see the impact there uh, with having a, a very stunted root system, thick stubby roots. There was not a nodule on this plant. And so a legume that doesn't have nodules or a legume that can't fix nitrogen, uh, it might as well be a grass. And uh, it's also got some yellowing of leaves up here, which was a manganese toxicity. And so um, the other thing I'll point out, these are dig sticks. And some of you, your groups would have used these. We use them a lot. Um, with groups, uh, you bang them into the ground, twist them, pull them out, and they give you an intact soil core that's open on the side. We then use um, just a, a color indicator, squirt it on the soil, um, uh, and then it changes color depending on the soil pH, where um, purpley colors up around um, seven, green colors are around six, and the yellow colors are down around um, four. 
in um, and that's in pH equivalent in measured in water. So uh, basically, yellow yellow is really really bad. Uh, green is good, uh, and and that bluey purple color um, you're up around neutral. And so this soil, you can see basically uh, where it was limed, we've got amelioration in the top 10 centimeters or so when we've got root growth happening there. Um, it's still a little, little bit blue down here, uh, a little bit um, green, pale green down here. Whereas where the lime is missed, it's almost yellow the entire way through and that why that, that's why that plant uh, is suffering so much. Um, of course, if you've got your exchange sites filled up by aluminium, then there's less room for the good good things to uh, to be held in soil, and so nutrients like uh, magnesium, calcium, and also potassium will get. Uh, they, there's nowhere for them to to be held in the topsoil, and they'll leach further down. And so your topsoils can become deficient in magnesium, calcium, potassium, um, because there's so much aluminium and acidity in the topsoil on a, on a very acid soil. So. Um, I, I just want to raise that because some people say, oh, we, we can create, uh, we'll, we will breed aluminium tolerant plants. Well, that might be the case, but they're going to be uh, aluminium tolerant and magnesium and calcium deficient, which means you're going to have to add them. Um, there are other spin offs as well. Um, when you've got a lot of aluminium in the soil solution, it uh, sticks to phosphate and takes phosphate out of solution. And so you can be adding uh, P via fertilizer or organic amendment. Uh, and when that pea becomes available in a plant available form, it will bind up with aluminium and then get taken out of solution. So a plant can't get it. So um, that creates an inefficiency in your system. So you have to spend more money to, to basically get less. And the other thing I uh, just wanna share with you is a lot of work that we do, um, we keep coming across the, these evidence of of impacts on production that you don't read about in the literature and, and people don't report. And uh, what we found is where you've got acid soils, you tend to get a lot more disease um, impact and, and pest impact. And so what's basically happening there, we think is you, you get a stressed plant and then that plant is then more susceptible to disease and pathogen. Um, and there's also some triggers there that, that um, target but it becomes a target then for pest as well and so um, removing this acidity from our system yes it gets rid of aluminium and it's good for root growth and then the legumes can fix nitrogen but it's also making your plant stronger and healthier and, and I think that probably helps make the system become a little bit more resilient so that when um, stresses do come to the pasture uh, it's a little bit more capable to to shrug it off and and uh, get on being productive uh, one of the things I definitely want to leave with you is that uh, productive agriculture is acidifying and there's really no way um, we can't shirk that, we can't avoid that. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, 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 a truth that we have to deal with. And this happens because basically when uh, plants grow, the soils become acid. And this is happening because as the plants take up nutrients, the, one of the side effects of that is the plant actually excretes acid into the soil. And in doing so, the plant top becomes alkaline. And so in a normal system, as a plant grows, the soil becomes acid, the plant becomes alkaline and the plant dies and that alkalinity goes back to the soil and would neutralize it. And you kind of got this balanced system. But of course in agriculture, we remove the plant. We either, um, uh, we can cut it, we can bale it, we can turn it into silage, we can harvest it as grain, uh, we can put it through an animal and convert it into fibre or meat and then sell it. But agriculture is pretty much about using using that plant. And so that's just a, that's just a, a transaction cost of agriculture. We acidify the soil. We then um, kind of um, turbocharge that a little bit with uh, nitrogen inputs, uh, urea, ammonium-based fertilizers, your DAPs, MAPs, and uh, even legume fixation itself, getting more nitrogen into the system has a side effect of the system becoming more acidic. All of those things, I'm not saying they're bad things, I'm just saying that there's a consequence for that extra production and the consequence is, is acidity. And uh, I guess just as evidence of that, I want to show you a graph, I'm going to show you a few graphs, but um, 
my graphs, the, the y-axis going down the page, we've got soil depth here in centimetres and the x-axis going across the page uh, is um, pH again in calcium chloride, four on the left, seven up near neutral on the right. And so uh, this is a paddock that uh, Helen Burns found up near Canoundra and basically there was a, a cemetery, uh, undisturbed native pasture, had never been, you know, it was never had a sheep in it, grazing it, never cropped or anything like that. Um, and soil sampled down to 20 centimetres and the pH kind of looked like that. Um, 40 metres away in a paddock, same soil type. The only difference is that um, within the paddock, it had been under agriculture for about 80 years. Uh, really highly productive um, crop legume pasture base rotation, great yields, super fertile soil, uh, had a history of lime, but the pH looked like that. And so what, what you've got there is a high pH at the surface. Some of that might be because that plant return, that the debris um, residue of the plants hitting the surface, that alkaline plant material hitting the surface. And some of it would be because of that liming history as well. But I just want to point out that, you know, what you can see in the middle there is there's this movement to the left, this acidification, um, sort of below five centimetres. And that's a product of that agricultural production. And I just want to make the point clearly, agriculture is acidifying. And so if you are producing things in agriculture, you, your profiles are always moving to the left in these graphs. And I can show you evidence from this from other publications, like it's just a known thing. And so how fast you move to the left uh, is a product of you know, rainfall and soil fertility and how productive you are, the product removal. Um, but that's the journey. We're always moving to the left unless you, you bring that back towards the right by adding alkali back into the system, which is what lime is. Um, listening to Mark's talk and hearing some of the questions, I uh, had the advantage of being able to uh, add slides to my talk. And so I just wanted to, uh, to um, share with you some work that um, we published uh, almost 10 years ago now, which looked at uh, three long-term trials with different rotations. Um, and it basically, um, we looked at the soil and we looked at the relationship between carbon, nitrogen and pH. And just as, um, as Mark uh, demonstrated, if you want more carbon, you've got to increase nitrogen. And so in these three graphs, they're the three long-term trials. Uh, on the x-axis is the percent of nitrogen in the soil. On the y-axis is percent of carbon in the soil. And in all three of those long-term trials, you can see a very clear trend there of if you want the carbon to increase, you've got to increase nitrogen. Um, and so more plant growth, you need more nitrogen in the system to get that extra plant growth, uh, which is exactly what Mark, Mark said. But uh, what our work then showed was that um, if you look at that percent N and the impact of that nitrogen gain on soil pH, then you got this sort of trend, which was basically as nitrogen increased, soil pH decreased. So what I'm saying there is that um, if you are building soil carbon and you need more nitrogen to do that, a consequence will be your soil will acidify. Um, and so you then have to offset that by applying lime, which has its carbon, carbon footprint as well. But there are no, uh, no free rides in agriculture. So increasing carbon will, based on our long-term trials, um, decrease pH. So there's a cost to it. In terms of our current management of acidity, um, it's interesting looking at this from a historic point of view. There are really good reasons why people did what they did and do what they do, um, but we definitely need to revisit it. Uh, just because that's what was done doesn't mean it's the right thing now. And so um, basically uh, we've got, sorry, let's get rid of that. We've got um, people measuring soil pH in 10 centimetre intervals, not to 10. Some people might be doing a 10 to 20 as well. And this was, um, you know, traditional soil sampling was definitely not to 10 soil sample. Um, and you, you look for pH and aluminium. Um, what has happened? Then people would be applying lime. Uh, once the pH got below say 4.8, 
Um, now, when you talk to people, that varies. Sometimes they apply lime when it gets down to 4.5 or less. Um, but generally, people are doing something once the pH drops below 4.8. And that's largely because once the pH drops below 4.8, as you've seen before, aluminium tends to increase. And so they're just trying to avoid um, having aluminium being a problem. And they will apply enough lime to get the pH in calcium chloride to get above five because above five you, you remove that toxic level of, of aluminium and so um, we do that because back in the 80s and early 90s when people started to use lime um, it was relatively expensive to the value of the land and uh, so you wanted to be able to demonstrate to someone look if you put lime out you'll get a benefit uh, and you put enough lime out to get rid of aluminium, you saw your benefit. If you put more lime on above that, you didn't see a benefit for that extra lime. And so that's what people did. But in doing so, what we kind of did is, if you like, um, we apply lime once the pH gets below 4.8, when the aluminium starts to hurt us, and we're applying enough lime to get us out of that hurt. And then we soon come back into hurt again, enough lime to get out. So we're just always moving in and out of suffering from aluminium toxicity and the other effects of it acidity um, which when you think about it is a pretty like a yes you see a response to adding lime but you're always suffering there's always suffering there and like you wouldn't do that you in your own human health you wouldn't suffer and then do something if, if you knew that you could there was something that you could do to make you never suffer you'd do that so um, the amount of lime that people apply might have been a rule of thumb and so um, in our neck of the woods you know, when you talk to people, oh, it's two and a half tonnes to the hectare every 10 years, which um, was was roughly, you know, back an envelope calculation of, acidi of acidification rates in the 1980s, that was about right. Um, but the problem with that is that we are so much more productive now than we were, you know, four decades ago. And our systems have changed. We're using a lot more nitrogen. We've got dual purpose crops. We've cut... Um, We've cut crops for, for hay. Um, so our, our acidification rates are, are higher. And so um, these rules of thumb probably uh, aren't doing us any favors at the moment. Um, some people will be measuring pH and then applying lime to get, like I said before, get, get to a certain pH target. And um, in New South Wales, we have an ag fact table or a prime fact table, which looks like that. I know in Victoria, you have lime calculators as well. Um, the, um, the soil testing companies have decision support systems, which basically have models in them. This table is just a table version of a model, which are the same models that are in a lot of those decision support systems. But basically you can see there that um, we've got a soil test um, cation exchange capacity here, which is like a, a pseudo buffering capacity. Um, and you'll notice that as you move down the page here, you take this is the amount of lime it takes to get from pH 4 to 5.2. So as the buffering capacity or the CEC increases, you need more lime to get the same change as you would uh, with less lime at a lower buffering capacity. And this table, these three columns here are all trying to get you to 5.2, which is the bit that gets rid of aluminium. Um, and so you know, that's what people would use to, to um, uh, calculate a, a liming rate. One of the problems with this is that table is generated from research that used high quality lime applied to the soil surface and rotary hoed into the soil to 10 centimetres. And then the outcome of that is what's in this table. And of course, in the real world now, um, we've got a lot of people who are applying lime, not incorporating it at all, certainly not using a rotary hoe. And I'm not saying you'd want to do that anyway, but that's how the research was done back then. Uh, and so we've got a case where the practice of applying lime doesn't replicate how this table was generated. And so it, it's of no surprise to me at all that you hear of people saying, oh, I put on, you know, I put on two and a half tons of lime, but the pH didn't change as much as it should have, you know, or I didn't see a response to that lime. Um, that could be one of the reasons why. So the outcome of that history, uh, just to show you that, so pH on the x-axis, depth 20 centimetres on the y-axis. Um, this is a, a, some soil survey work that was done uh, looking at, at soils that had been picked for legume 
grain legume production. So these are, were soils that the farmers thought were pretty good in terms of pH. And basically there are two groups here. One that's had lime less than five in the, you know, um, in, in the last five years, and one that's had lime more than five years ago. And so uh, what you can see there is basically that the lime that's been applied has had no impact below uh, the depth of application. So it, yes, it's made a difference in the top, but it's really no different um, below that. And the acidity is still a problem. And so in both of these cases, we still have these, what we call our acid subsurface layers. There are acid layers occurring below the, the top few centimetres. And so in, in both of these cases, the growers have spent money putting on lime. They, they, they therefore thought they've done the right thing, but the acidity is still in the system limiting production. Now, they, one of the other problems with that is if we use our 0 to 10 soil sampling, well, that, this curve, this one on the left, the test that you sent that sample off to the lab, it would come back at 4.6 and you'd think that you'd had an acidity problem and you'd probably apply more lime and that's fine. This one on the right though, it would come back from the lab with a pH of 5.3 and you would think that I don't have a problem with acidity here. And so this is, this is the problem with our, our sampling uh, strategies to date. We have um, a case where um, people have put the lime on, they might even be measuring pH at, in, to 10 centimetres and the numbers are coming back saying the lime's working, but the reality is that the system's got this nasty bit of acidity here. That, the, and the worst thing of that is the grower doesn't even know that the problem's there unless they go testing for it. So how do we find those layers? Just to share with you some um, research that we did here. So pH on the x-axis uh, from a 0 to 10 or from a 10 centimetre in increment. So if you like, our x-axis here is exactly the, the result that you'd get back from a lab if you sent soil off um, to, to be analysed from, from a, a 0 to 10 centimetre soil sample. On the y-axis, what we did with those soils is actually divide them up into two and a half centimetre increments and measured the pH of each, you know, two and a half centimetre in increment. And then I've plotted here on the y-axis what the pH was of the most acid layer within the top 10 centimetres. And so if the 0 to 10 sample, the, the value on the x-axis, actually was good at identifying or finding the most acid layer, that is the, the layer of acidity that's going to harm a plant, then we should have all of our data points hitting this one-to-one -one line. So our soil test that we send off to the lab is actually representing the mo you know, finding the, the acid layer, or in this case, the acid layer uh, that a plant would experience. And of course, when we look at the data, it looks like that. And you'll notice that there aren't many soil, many samples that sit on this line. There's an awful lot down here. Uh, and so what that's, what the ramification of that is, if you, if you look at, say, uh, let's look at this one. So the soil test came back. It said, I've got a pH of six in the 0 to 10. I don't have a problem with acidity, but in reality that 0 to 10 of 6 actually has a layer in it that has a pH of 4.5, which could have, like I said before, that could have 30% aluminium in it, which would be definitely harming plants. So um, our 0 to 10 is actually masking the true acidity, even within that top 10 centimetre layer. And so we then ask the question, well, rightio, oh, well, what increment actually does the job for us? What increment finds that acid layer? Because no one wants to sample in two and a half centimetre increments because um, you know, that's going to take forever and maybe a bit costly. So um, we ran a bunch of different scenarios and found five centimetre increments. Now, so what our x-axis here is, is the soil value if you took a five centimetre increment and sent it off to the lab. And so looking at the naught to five, that's what the data looks like. And so we get a lot more of these data points up near this dotted line, which is saying that my soil test value that I'm getting back from the lab actually represents the acidity that the plant's gonna see. And then for the five to 10 centimeter layer, they're up there again, there are a lot of those on the line. And so what I'm 
saying with this, this is the data, the evidence that says, if you use naught to 10 centimeter samples to try to find if you have acid subsurface layers, you are going to get a number which probably doesn't represent what's actually happening and doesn't represent what a plant will see. If you use five centimeter layers, the number you get back from the lab is what a plant will see. And so you're much better at, this is a, a, a method that much better identifies the presence of acid subsurface layers. Once you've found it, what do we do with it? How do we deal with that? Um, now in pasture systems, perennial pasture systems or on existing pastures, you need to apply lime to the surface and rely on lime movement. Um, you know, your opportunity in a pasture system to incorporate lime occurs when you are establishing that pasture. And so if you can incorporate lime in at pasture establishment, that's when you do it. Um, if, if you've already got a pasture there, then it's apply lime to the surface and, and uh, wait for that lime to move down. How or what drives that? So this is work that was done um, 30 years ago. And so uh, it was just uh, in between Wagga and Albury. And what they did here was they found an acid soil had a pH of about 4.1 or two, something like that. Um, they went and they established three liming rates. So they put lime at, at zero, so a control at two tons, which is the number, the, the rate that would get you um, up around five to get rid of aluminium and eight tons of lime per hectare, which you would understand is a lot. Um, and then they, they rotary hoed those treatments in to a depth of about um, eight centimetres. They grew sub clover pasture and they came back five years later and they soil sampled in two centimetre intervals. And so five years later, this is what they found. So the control soil, uh, you'll notice we've got this stratification happening again. So even though this was rotary hoed and it all would have been the same initially, we've got this stratification happening and we've got this acid subsurface layer present. At two tonnes of lime, we got an increase in pH to the depth of incorporation. Okay, so lime will increase pH to the depth at which you put it at two tonnes, but you didn't get a significant increase in pH below the depth of incorporation. So when you lime to just remove aluminium, that is hit a target of around five. And if you look at the average of this, say top 10 centimeters, the average of that would be pretty close to five. Uh, you don't get any alkali or the, the liming effect below the depth of incorporation. Okay, now that is exactly what our historic best practice lime management uh, or acid soil management has been doing. It's been liming to get rid of aluminium. And so um, all, of our, all of our good practice of just put on lime to get rid of aluminium in the naught to 10 centimetres has been doing this. So we haven't been doing anything below our depth of incorporation. However, when eight tonnes was put on, we did get significant and um, increases in pH below the depth of incorporation. In this case, it's about four centimetres below, significant increases in pH after five years. Now, unfortunately, when this work was done, the take home message by extension community was if you want lime to move down the profile, you need to put on high rates of lime. And everyone said, well, that's uneconomic, move on. And they kept doing what they've been doing. Unfortunately, in the paper, it actually talks about why the alkalinity moved. And it's not because it was a high rate of lime, it's because that rate of lime was enough to get the pH up over five and a half. And when the pH gets up over five and a half, there's excess alkali that can then move down the profile. And it just so happened that this site, because it was so acid and the pH was around 4.1 or 4.2, it took eight tons of lime to get the pH on average up over five and a half. But if the pH was say 5.2 to begin with, it wouldn't take much lime to get it up there. So it's not how much lime you put on. How much lime you put on doesn't impact the rate of alkali movement down. The, the true thing is, is my pH, do I get, does the lime application get my pH up over five and a half? And the sooner you 
have an intervention to get your pH up over five and a half, um, the, the better in terms of if you wait for the profile to really acidify, then it's going to be a high rate of lime that you need. Taking that further, um, long-term trial um, done uh, east of Wagga. Um, I'm going to show you now, I'm changing my graph. So now I've got pH on the y-axis, very acidic at the bottom, increasing pH as we go up. And I've got years on the x-axis, this is the years of, of, um, of the trial. So uh, I'm going to show you 0 to 10, and I'm going to show you 10 to 20, because that's how the trial was sampled. Now, a bunch of research and all the work that's been done around, uh, certainly around the Riverina, we know that if you lime up over five, let agriculture acidify down, re-lime once you get to about 4.8 to get up over, you know, five again, agricultural acidifiers, re-limes. This is like our maintenance liming rates or of current best practice acid soil management. We know, and I showed you just then, when you do that, you don't get an increase in pH below the depth of incorporation. And so what happens is the pH of the 10 to 20 continues to decline. And so, you know, this is getting around pH 4, that's really bad. And in this particular soil, you know, it's 30 or 40% aluminium. So that's, that's, that's a really bad outcome. So um, what the master trial showed was that when you change that and you say, Rodeo, let's change the target rather than be always bouncing in and out of this, you know, uh, no aluminium, now I've got aluminium, no aluminium, now I've got aluminium. Let's get the pH and apply lime to get it up over five and a half <clears throat> and keep it up there. And so what that looks like is this. And in this particular experiment, it took 3.7 tonnes to get this increase. Now, some of you, I don't know how you view the world, but some of you might be thinking 3.7 tonnes, that's a lot. But Traditionally, these farmers would have been putting on two and a half tonnes anyway. So it's really only 1.2 tonnes more once. So getting them up, um, up into the uh, above five and a half. And then agriculture acidifies down. Where's my mouse gone? Agriculture acidifies down. And then we... Uh, and then we can have our maintenance liming rates going up again as we move to the right, the pH drops away again, the maintenance rate of lime brings it up over five and a half again. Now, when we do that, what the research found was in the 10 to 20 layer, the pH increased and it was a gradual increase. And so it was about 0.9 of a pH units in 18 years that the pH in the 10 to 20 increased or because initially in year one, they put on enough lime to get the pH up over five and a half. Yes, initially that was incorporated in as the, all the, the um, pastures were established, but after that, all those maintenance rates, all those maintenance liming events, they were all surface application. And by doing that, we got an increase in our 10 to 20 centimetres. So now it's up around pH five and it doesn't have an aluminium toxicity problem anymore. And so that's a long term, if you like, 18 years, system benefit, natural resource benefit from a decision that happened 18 years ago to maintain our pH up over five and a half. And the cost of that was, was 1.2 tonnes of lime extra, which isn't a lot. So, um, okay, if that's our target, um, we need to know the best way to get there and, and I'm fortunate to be involved uh, in research with a range of collaborators, largely funded by the uh, National Land Care Program um, and, uh, and sort of pulled together in a project called Future Soils. And we basically uh, have, a, have a, I think there's about 15 um, experimental sites, replicated sites throughout uh, the landscape. And on these sites, uh, we have control, we have lime to get us to a pH of about 5.2. So that's the sort of best practice, current practice um, that people have been doing. We've got lime to 5.9 or, you know, roughly about that, um, but maintain the pH above five and a half. So there'll be, that's our liming trigger. Our re-trigger to lime uh, or re-lime is when the pH gets to um, 
five and a half, you lime again to keep it up to maximize that movement of the liming effect downwards. And so these three treatments we have in all of our replicated trials and the size of the trials range just depending on who we're dealing with and what gear is available. In some cases, you know, it's you know a four meter by 50 plot um, for each treatment. In some cases, they're, you know, 36 meters wide and, you know, I think 400 meters long for each plot. So it just depends. Uh, but they're, they're paddock scale. Uh, where people um, can't incorporate, so it might be erosion risk is too great or uh, they're dealing with perennial pastures, existing perennial pastures. One of the, one of the thoughts is, radio. well, why would you put on lime that's calculated to ameliorate pH to 10 centimetres when you're only ever putting it on the surface, which basically means that there's a there's going to be a period of excess lime sitting on the surface and lime it's a really tricky product because it needs acid to dissolve and as the pH increases it the the solubility of the lime decreases so you get to about uh, probably pH um, pH 7 and the lime stops dissolving and it'll just sit there and so if you put on enough lime to get the pH up to around six in the in 10 centimetres, depth of 10 centimetres, and you're just putting that on the surface, an awful lot of that lime is just going to sit there. It might break down over time, but you know the, the risk there is that it can erode off or blow away. And so one of the ideas is that maybe we, we put less lime on, but put it on more often. And so we've, we've um, calculated the treatment that aims at just ameliorating the top five centimetres uh, rather than 10 and just uh, apply that to the surface so it fits in a, in a um, is this an efficient way of putting on lime in a permanent pasture context. Now I understand there's a cost involved in applying lime, I get that, this is proof of concept stuff. So let's work out whether the efficiency of using a less lime more often approach outweighs the cost of that those extra applications. Where people can incorporate, we've got incorporation treatments. And so um, some of that's uh, different implements, um, some of it's different depth of incorporation as well. And so we've got in some places we incorporate to 18 centimetres with, with um, really cool machinery. Uh, in other cases, it might be just with gear that's in the farmer's shed uh, that everyone has. Um, but we're looking at, at the um, most efficient way to get that, that lime into the soil. Now, if you are going to incorporate and you've got acidity, you know, say you've got acid subsurface layers down to 15 centimetres, 20 centimetres, then there's a mindset there that says, Rodeo, if I'm going to cultivate, then let's make it worthwhile. So let's, let's really cultivate it in. So this is a picture of a horse tiger. So um, it's, you know, it slices, it dices, it mixes, it, it presses, it does all these things. But it's quite effective at mixing lime into the soil down to sort of you know, 15, 18 centimetres in our trials. Um, but if you're going to have that incorporation, then put on enough lime to ameliorate the acidity that's there. So let's let's do the job in one hit, we call it once in a generation, because you, if you do that now, you should only have to do maintenance uh, lime application to the surface, keeping the pH up over five and a half, and the system shouldn't acidify to the point where you get, you know, aluminium toxicity. And so we've got those treatments in there as well. It's pretty extreme, granted, but uh, I know farmers are doing it even without the research. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but I just want to show you these are three sites that we've got. Um, up the top there, we've got the pH in the five. 15 centimetre layer and you'll notice that like Lindhurst is quite acidic and Tugong isn't very acidic at all. Um, and then down, down the page we've got how much lime it takes for each treatment. So liming rate target of, of 5.2, sort of the current best practice, how much lime does it take? Liming to get the pH up over five and a half, what's that? Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail here but I just want to show you that. The thing that should come in your mind when you look at that where you've got the worst acidity, you have the highest liming rates. Okay, now my point with this is, is simple. If you have a soil that isn't horrifically acidic, now's the time to do something about your acidity because it takes a smaller amount of lime to fix a problem that's not that bad. Okay, so it's, it's, it's maintaining your soil. That Tugon soil is a very productive soil 
that hasn't in those graphs, or if you remember with the acid, agriculture taking the acidity to the left, making the acid worse, it hasn't got that far yet, but it will. So if we address it now, it doesn't actually take a lot of lime to do it. Even the once in a generation is only 3.8 tonnes, which isn't a lot um, for amelioration to depth down to 15 centimetres. If you wait and it's very acid, then yes, you're dealing with higher lime rates, but um, you, you are fixing the problem with those lime rates. To give you an indication of how successful this is, this is um, a dual purpose canola at uh, Morven uh, last year. And you can see the nil treatment there, really plants were buggered. They had um, manganese toxicity coming from the acidity, really stunted root growth. Where we had uh, lime applied and the lime was incorporated in, INC is incorporated, NI is not incorporated. Where we incorporated lime, you always got better root growth, fibrous root system, and basically the higher rates of lime, the more roots you got and the plants loved you for it. We took plant tissue because it was grazing canola. We were worried about nitrate levels and the impact on stock health. And what we actually found there is that um, for the same amount of nitrogen that was top dressed, the limed plant had more nitrate in the plant. So this is something that we didn't really, hadn't thought through, but it, um, there's reasons for it. When you lime the plant, because it's healthier, and it actually has the better nutrient use efficiency. So the, the, the nitrogen that you're throwing at the, at the plant as urea, more of it's getting in the plant. So um, your system's better. It's, it's much more efficient system in all ways. Looking down into those plots, on the left is nil lime, on the right, four tons of lime incorporated. So what you see there is on the left, there's weeds everywhere. On the right, there are no weeds. The plants established really quick, big, strong, healthy plants, completely smothered out any roots, the root, uh, sorry, any um, weeds, the uh, weeds couldn't take hold. So, yeah, you know, this was in a farmer's paddock, so they, they um, herbicide use was what it was, but clearly on the right, you don't need to spray the weeds in that, whereas on, on the left, you do. Now, is it worth doing? Just looking at production outcomes um, from trials that are in the literature. So I've got um, the region on the left, what was done, uh, the enterprise pasture, response to lime. So that's compared to a unlimed control. And then the average gross margin gain um, compared to no lime and, and who published the work. And just highlighting that all of the gross margins here, the economics, it's all um, pinned to the uh, date at which the publication came out. So it's, it's um, economics of the day. So this is the master site, master trial. And so in a, a perennial pasture environment with uh, sheep, lime was uh, um, able to get almost four DSE extra. And that, in that system, that was a, um, about a 20% increase in stocking rate. And back then, uh, it was a $25 extra um, gross margin with lime. And that's with the cost of lime applied everything into that. Um, but that's back in the 90s, that economics. And I can tell you that economics, the best case scenario for wool at that time was uh, 750 cents per kilogram. So things have changed. Um, this is cattle, 16% more beef production, a gross margin of about $90 uh, for the roughly the same period in the 90s. Uh, here we are in the uh, Southern Tablelands. Um, now this, uh, this is a demonstration trial and they got an extra um, 2.4 DSC when lime was applied and super went on every third year. And um, they actually lost money so that system on average had a gross margin of less than $4. But when you looked into this, that was because during the drought, they had more livestock there. They kept those livestock on the plot and they supplementary fed them and put all that feed on the bill. And that's why that's, that number is like it is. Interestingly, using the same methodology where you applied lime and put superphosphate on every year, the extra carrying capacity went up to 5.6 DSE and even then, with the supplementary feeding, uh, the gross margin was uh, almost fifty dollars. And again, back in that's in the in the uh, early two thousands when uh, livestock prices weren't at the, as they are. A trial that is current, um, Matt Lischke's work, 
uh, at Lagan, which is uh, a, a great, great study. Um, and he showed, um, you know, a three DSE increase where Lyme was used. Um, and with today's economics, that that three DSE is a 180 uh, extra, uh, 180 extra dollars per hectare um, because of that that liming. And so, when you, I guess my point with this is, if you take the production increase and look at it on today's money, um, like you are making money, you're making serious money from that liming, and this particular bit here shows that once you get rid of the, um, the limitation, the acidity, if you then provide the system with nutrition, it becomes really productive. But you've got to have the extra stock in there to make they to capitalize on that extra pasture. Matt's work, uh, one of the great things about it was he looked at pasture composition, uh, through the year and he demonstrated that a lot of this production gain, this carrying capacity gain actually occurred from uh, legume production due to the liming early in autumn. And so the, the clovers took off, put nitrogen into the system and then that drove the, the perennial grasses that were there. So um, that was a great um, uh, outcome because there was clovers in the system and liming enabled the clovers to take off, fix more nitrogen. Just to finish now, um, one of my favorite photos, this is um, a Google Earth image of one of the paddocks here at the University CSU. Uh, this shows historic liming trials. So these stripes are uh, lime that were, was applied in 1989 at about two and a half tonnes the hectare. Uh, this photo is um, in the drought in the early 2000s and this is loosen. And so there's dark bits uh, where lime was applied um, in 1989 and the lucerne is responding to that. Uh, on the right, this is peas. And um, again, you can see there's a three times the biomass on the on the limed sections to the unlimed sections. And so um, this is in a drought, that lucerne in a drought, the value of that feed was enormous. And it just highlights that lime repays you when you need it most. You get the, the, the impact of a system that's not under stress um, from because you've addressed the acidity um, in bad years, like a drought year or a bad start, that's when removing the acidity actually repays you most. So just to address the scenarios that were given, um, so topsoil targets are low and won't stop subsurface acidity forming. That's true, that's a true statement. There's no moving away from that. But lime is expensive. Is it worth applying if there are other limiting factors? Uh, liming is expensive, but I'd argue that if you're a producer who wants to keep producing into the future and wants to be able to stand in front of people and say, I'm doing things which are going to leave my property as good or better condition, you need to be able to say that you're addressing acidification. Because if you're not, you're moving further to the left and, and you are degrading the system. Uh, so it's definitely worth applying. The other limiting factors, we need to know what they are and we, we definitely need to pr prioritise them and, and triage your, your paddocks as well. So there'll be some paddocks that, that need attention now. There'll be times when uh, you, you're going to establish a, a re regenerate a pasture, um, you know, re-sow it. That's your time to, that's your opportunity to, to lime, you know, because you, you're going to potentially working the, the soil in. Uh, so you get that mixing, mixing gets you that head start in uh, ameliorating the city deeper down. The um, lagging work um, shows that, or oh, sorry, the, the uh, Southern Tableland shows that uh, if you get rid of the acidity and then use your fertilizer, you'll get that production gain, but you've got to have the, the livestock there to capitalize on that extra production. Doesn't look like lime is moving, so is it worth it? It won't move if you don't keep the pH up over five and a half. Um, and so I'd argue, um, you know, if you've got acidity lower down and you want to do something about it, you've got to get that pH up over five and a half and it doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money to do that. But the longer you wait, the longer, the, the, the more lime you'll end up having to apply to do it. Are the targets good for country? Yes, they are. I wouldn't say just though, because you're going to make money out of it. And, um, and so 
Uh, and not only that, the next generation will thank you for it as well, because we don't know what the future holds, but if, if we're going to get more adverse years, dry years, harder finishes, whatever, um, removing a basic limitation, which is soil acidity, which is something that affects plant root growth, that is your ability to extract water out of the soil and nutrients out of the soil, and uh, also impacts on soil biology. Um, you know, if you remove that stress, then your system's more resilient. Um, yes, it takes money, but uh, limes, are, it's not an annual fertilizer. It's a long-term benefit to the system. Poor pastures, I would say that if you've got a legume content, liming them, there'll be a benefit to that. Um, you know, hills are an issue and and I, I work with growers in hilly areas and this is, this is the biggest problem. There are some areas you can't drive a spreader. Um, and so you can't, you literally cannot get lime on the ground and that that's an issue for us. Um, we probably need to understand the rate of acidification of those of those bits as well. But I would say, uh, well, if that's the case, don't spend too much time worrying about it, but um, make sure that the other areas where you can get lime out, you're actually looking after the soil there. Um, acid already, live with it, fix it. I'd argue that, um, uh, well, we know, we know agriculture makes the acidity worse. And so the people that say, oh, it's already acid, so therefore I have no responsibility in looking after it, are having themselves on, that's a cop out. Um, you know, if you, if you have an acid soil and you continually acidify it, what you do is dissolve the clay and you make, um, you damage the soil that, no, you know, 10 generations from now, the damage is still gonna be there. So we, we, can, we, need to, we need to look after our natural resource. And just to finish up, just want to thank all the people that collaborate with us. Um, and um, it's a pleasure to work with them. We're doing some great work. Um, questions. So our first speaker was Sandy Middleton. Is um, Sandy there that can, he's from the Holbrook Landcare Network. He might not be, so we'll just wait there and Michelle might hunt him down. But I see we've got Matthew Hall from the Perennial Pasture Systems Group. Matthew, do you just want to make a few comments about some of the insights that you've had from your soil acidity um, work with the group? If you can just yep. unmute yourself. Yep. Yep. No worries, Lisa. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yep. Yep. No worries. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, I run a mixed family sheep and cropping um, farm about 15 kilometres east of Stall. Um, I'm in the perennial pasture systems group. We had our soil workshop sessions at um, Elmhurst, Joel Joel and Ararat, which covered a fair part of our area. Um, as we know, the soils in our area are quite varied. Um, we've got a big variation from probably medium clays to a lot of sodic soda soles and um, like gravelly rises and that sort of thing. So there's a fair, fair variation in the area um, with, yeah, as Jason was talking about, a lot of pH and aluminium toxic issues um, that we generally have to deal with. So um, in our session with Lisa, we went over soil testing and interpreting our soil tests, um, probably it opened a few of our eyes to some of the um, some of the levels that we needed to look at and some of the constraints that come with that. We um, did a fair bit of calculating, like the lime rates and um, effects of gypsum as well. Um, part of our sessions, we brought a sample or maybe a couple of samples of soil each along, and um, we had some some home test kits there to have a play around with. Some of the kits didn't quite work like they maybe should have. There was a little bit of a batch issue, I think, in some of the test kits. But um, overall, we got to have a look at, um, yeah, a few things in the session, and that was quite valuable. Um, with some people that had used a fair bit of lime in the past, like I probably have been, and, um, and some places that hadn't. So we, um, in our... One of our other sessions, we looked at the clover nodulation with uh, Belinda Hackney, and that was that was a really good session. Probably something that not a lot of us had done a lot of before was actually looking and scoring our our clover nodules. Um, we brought our own sample along to that session as well, and 
we were probably surprised at the range. There were some samples that were really good, had really good nodulation, and some that were quite poor, actually. Um, so it was, that was quite an eye-opener, actually, to, to get that sort of across the group and, and be able to have a good look at it. Um, we've been using lime on our farm for probably around 15 years or so now. Um, as was in Jason's graph, quite a lot of our farm is in that 4.3 to 4.5 range with the aluminium up around the 30% in areas that haven't had lime. Um, we've been probably, well, probably might change with thinking around a little bit now, um, but yeah, we've been using a, a blanket rate of that sort of two and a half to three tonne of the hectare for the first time, always incorporate um, with part of our cropping rotation. And yeah, we've got some paddocks that we're coming around to the second application and we are finding we're getting a result, but yeah, possibly might have to look at it a bit closer in some of the layers. Um, so it's pretty easy to, to see what areas of the farm we've used lime on and what we haven't. Um, the clover tells you straight away. We've got paddocks that were pretty well very unproductive um, that, yeah, with one or sometimes a second application of lime, yeah, they're, they're just a complete turnaround. You get whole fast GT established with really good clover base and, um, yeah, it completely changes, well, yeah, how you can manage the, the farm. So, um, yeah, we've, we've been using it for a while. Probably we've been using a few of the, some of the acid tolerant varieties like Uplands, Coxfoot and those sorts of things. Sometimes using that after the first time that any of our lands had lime. So that, that probably gets around a little bit of the acidity that might be at depth for a start. And then after the second application, yeah, we're really targeting the higher production flareuses and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, I guess it's just, um, yeah, balancing up whether you uh, yeah, look at choosing species that are a bit more suited to, to handling it in the early stages of when you use lime. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely trying pretty hard to, to at least fix a fair bit of the problem. We might have to look at maybe increasing the rates a little bit perhaps, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll get around to that. And I'm probably looking at playing around with a little bit of variable rate um, application in the future. Um, yeah, we've got fairly big variations within the paddock and that's probably somewhere that I think we're looking at going as well. So. Okay, that's terrific. It's um, good to hear, I suppose, that um, you know, you're know you taking on some of the messages that Jason spoke about, but you're already um, mm -hmm. already sort of right stuck into it. So yeah, okay. thank, thank you very much, Matt, for um, uh, talking to us. Um, I right. might sort of pass over to um, Jason. With, um, Jason, you've been answering some of the, the questions on chat. Were there any other questions there that um, you could see that um, you'd like to address? Yeah, so um, oh, just a, like the, the uh, dig stick. So um, we get them from the guy that makes them. It's the cheapest way to get them because no one does cut out the middle man. Um, and I, I'll have to find, I'll find the phone number for the guy um, for you. Um, Craig asked about do the carbon nitrogen and the pH have an equilibrium? Um, Susan would be able to talk about the carbon equilibrium, um, but I think you probably get to a stage where un, un, unaddressed or un, um, untouched, the acidity actually will, will create an equilibrium. It'll actually stop some of the biological processes happening uh, if, you, if it drops too low. Um, and then, then your plant growth suffers and then you kind of get this a biological equilibrium. So um, you can, if you take away, if you're putting on lime, uh, the equilibrium probably becomes uh, a rainfall dependent one. And then, um, you know, if you've got irrigation, honestly, I couldn't tell you what happens after that. Oh, Mark, Mark, yep. Mark's put his hand up. <laughs> yep, Mark, would you like to go ahead? Uh, sure. Um... Yeah, there's, there's two sides of the coin with the pH and, and carbon. Um, Dan Murphy actually produced a really good slide for the, I think one of the soil health books out of Souls West, 
where if you get below a certain pH and, I, and it's definitely entering your aluminium space, you are actually putting quite a break on microbial decomposition of the carbon. But by the same measure, you're obviously putting quite a break on production of the carbon in the first place. So you're effectively turning your soil into a very poor peat system, ultimately. <laughs> And, and, um, and losing so money doing it. Indeed. Um, yeah, yeah. I, it's not, not an approach I would advocate at all. But, um, it is an observation, though, that obviously when you get down to low pHs, it's not just the plants that suffer. Um, but yes, ultimately, across, across I, I echo what Jason said, that there's the sort of um, wheels within wheels there when it comes to um, when it comes to where an equilibrium might be, um, pH or nitrogen, pick you. Pick the main limiting factor, both are, both are implicated a lot of the time, and obviously um, the more nitrogen you apply, the more acidification you can end up with. So, But, but I think um, the way I look at that, Mark, is that, you know, you're a good producer, you're, you've applied lime, you've minimised that limitation, you're addressing your nutrient demand of your, your system, that crop of pasture, um, you know, your increase in productivity, you're going to be making, there's going to be more money there to then, back into maintaining that system so you're actually you know the, the the more productive the system is the better better off you are in so many different ways the danger becomes that if if you whilst you're in that phase of productivity if you're not maintaining your resource that will hurt you you'll you'll live to see that hurt you and, and where i've seen in terms of soil ph stuff it's the system fails like it's a dramatic failure like you just yeah. you just get species just drop out of pastures and so um and then you've got a problem like well what how happens now and then it becomes it's expensive and i always use the analogy like you're better off maintaining an engine like changing the oil than waiting for it to blow up and having to buy a new one it's an expensive thing to do whereas maintenance is always cheaper in the long run yeah wholly agree wholly agree and i think that's where the and of course the, the buffering capacity of organic matter as much as anything else plays into that in some regards as well. Um, yeah, I'm definitely on board with the idea that, that a more productive system is, is a more sustainable one in most cases. Okay, terrific. Well, that's great discussion. Now, I know that Sandy um, Middleton has just joined us um, as well. Um, Sandy, did you just want to spend just a couple of minutes just talking about um, the perspective from the whole land, Holbrook Landcare Network, and then we'll move on to um, the carbon topic. Thanks, Sandy. Um, yep, sorry, sorry for logging in late. Um, yeah, so we, I've, with my clients and with um, a lot of the work that's been done by Jason and Helen Burns and Holbrook Landcare, we've had a massive focus on lime in our area and I've really had a big focus on it with a lot of my clients as well as within, within our own grazing business um, of I think a, a lot of the light bulbs have sort of been switching on of how this acidity issue is just ticking along underneath and uh, we haven't been diagnosing it probably correctly. Um, we know from you know what you learn in a textbook and, and university that if you're not liming you're just acidifying things and making a problem down the track that's going to be quite hard to rectify. So with current uh, commodity prices, we've, we've probably uh, had a big focus on um, softening off some of those profits um, into putting back into our soils. Um, and it's amazing that some of those guys that have really done some huge applications or huge programs of, um, you know, one client in particular who's done probably about 2,500 tonne of lime across a grazing business in the last three years, they're really starting to pick up and notice their carrying capacity is increased quite a bit. So uh, without putting full uh, DC figures on it, um, one of the things that John Francis from Agrista talks about is, you know, capitalising on that uh, stocking rate to make it pay. Um, we're starting to see the change in growth um, and dry matter. Um, 
from from those applications, which is pleasing. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence amongst clients that when we have that cutout spring, um, recently limed ones seem to hang on to green leaf a bit longer. And that's it's sort of something that I was hesitant to say with a lot of clients because it was something I was picking up on our own pace. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, I know that that's been done. Is it a bias in the back of my head? But um, when you talk to a few guys and you sort of say, oh, how are things holding on? It, it comes up, which is quite pleasing that obviously our root development is improving um, in those paddocks. So we're starting to see, it's a slow process, but we're starting to see some results from it. Um, I'd love to see more research into some of the benefits and, um, you know, I had a, had a research PhD candidate that I happened to stumble upon the other day who made a comment that in a limed plot, there was 40 units extra of nitrate available compared to nil lime. So, you know, that's, that's pretty massive. Um, yeah, so at the moment we can't can't get enough lime into our clients um, and even onto our own place. Um, just for me, it's just got to get this done so that we get some benefit, not just the kids down the track. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Sandy. That's um, that's excellent <laughs> um, comments that you've made, and and uh, yeah, we're we're really sort of backing up, I suppose, what Jason's been talking about, and and.